Welcome back to In Focus. Today we'll learn a lot more about the main hub for the 2019 Southeast Asian Games with our special guest, the Basis and Conversion Development Authority, President and CEO, Mr. Vince Dizon. Sir, thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you very much, Paolo. Thanks for having me. Sir, the BCDA, uh, part of the government, but then a lot of people don't necessarily know what the exact functions are. Uh, we all know that it's involved with Clark and uh, the basis there. But could you explain to us exactly what the purview of the BCDA is? Yeah, the BCDA was created way back in 1992. This was right after the Philippine Senate uh, did not renew the, the leases for the former basis of the United States. And it was created in order to, as the name implies, convert and develop uh, these former U.S. military bases into economic hubs mm -hmm. and new centers of growth. So in 1992, uh, Congress created BCDA, and since then, for the last 26 or so years, it's been busy uh, trying to master plan and develop former military bases into centers of economic growth, mm -hmm. basically into new cities, yeah. which obviously includes Clark, uh, mm -hmm. former Clark Air Base. Well, sir, the new Clark City, which is going to be the hub for the 2019 Southeast Asian Games, uh, obviously under your purview as well. And we take a look at developing uh, sporting, ve sporting venues like that, a sporting environment to be able to host a world-class event like uh, what they want to do for the SEA Games. And sir, can you explain to us the possible role models, the models that you looked at in actually developing that type of environment? You know, it was a major challenge to include the sports facilities, uh, the world-class sports facilities that we now have in the first phase of New Clark City. Because you have to understand New Clark City um, was really a master plan development to create a new metropolis outside mm -hmm. of Metro Manila. Yeah. Uh, what you see now that are there, the sports facilities, the athletes' village, they just form part of the entire fabric of the new city we're trying to build. So it was a challenge, um, especially since, uh, and here's a, a bit of trivia for you, the last time we built sports facilities that we can consider world-class was way, way back in 1934, mm -hmm. you know, which is more than 80 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, which is, of course, we know as Rizal Memorial, um, sports complex you know, yes. in, in Taft Avenue mm -hmm. in, in Manila. And um, so we, we haven't really had a lot of experience in building these types of facilities and not just in building them, but also in ensuring the sustainability of these facilities after we host a major event like the SEA Games. Mm -hmm. And that's really the major challenge. So when we planned uh, all of these facilities and when we placed them right in the middle of phase one development, of New Clark City, we had to look for a lot of benchmarks all over the world. And of course, we had to look for successful benchmarks because mm -hmm. as we all know, there have been not so successful yeah. experiences um, with the Olympics and other major sporting events. So we looked at um, two major ones you know, that we thought were very successful mm -hmm. um, and which have proven to be successful. The Queen Elizabeth Park development in London, okay. which hosted the games in 2012, yes. uh, the Olympic Games in 2012. And we also looked at the Sydney um, sports facilities mm -hmm. uh, for the Sydney Olympics. Yes. Uh, these were successful because they were able to allow them to blend in within the city uh, fabric after the games, meaning they weren't built, you know, like hundreds of kilometers away yeah. from the nearest city, yeah. but they were built right in the middle mm -hmm. of, 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 of the city, in London and in Sydney, in order for them to have multiple and mixed uses after mm -hmm. the Olympics. And um, that required a lot of what they call legacy planning. So these are the things that we considered uh, a lot when we were planning these sports facilities. A lot of lessons that we learned. First, don't build um, facilities that are too large. Yeah. For example, in London and in Sydney, the, the facilities that you saw during the games were actually not the, the permanent size of those facilities. They were actually half mm -hmm. the size of the facilities that you saw in the Olympics. What they did for the, for the games that they hosted, they just added temporary facilities to increase the, the capacity. For example, London, the capacity, I think, is 40,000, mm -hmm. but... 
the game's capacity was 70,000. Yeah. But the 30,000 was just... Was just added on ones. just to make yes. sure that more people could come. Mm -hmm. Yes, but all of those things were, were removed post-games. Mm -hmm. Now, unlike other facilities in the past, they were built like mega facilities that really weren't that viable economically yeah. after the games. Mm -hmm. So that, and we also wanted to make sure that the facilities were designed in such a way that the maintenance costs after the games would be minimal. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, for example, our aquatic center, we purposely made it open, meaning it's not air-conditioned. Yeah. Unlike, for example, the say the cube in, uh, in uh, Beijing. Yes. No, it's fully air-conditioned, and that's really a challenge and very expensive to maintain yes. after the games. So those kinds of interventions could only be done in the planning stages uh, to ensure the long-term sustainability. And I think we learned a lot from, our, from, our, um, from benchmarking the successful ones in London and in Sydney. Mm -hmm. So could you uh, detail to us how long that planning phase actually went before you, uh, the ground was actually broken? Because obviously, looking back at all those studies that you mentioned, I'm sure there have been a lot of uh, debates on how to do oh, yeah, things. Definitely. And uh, it took a while before everything was agreed upon. Just give us an idea of how long that process took. You know, we were lucky. We were lucky because we had a good partner, mm -hmm. MTD of, of Malaysia. It was a good partner, very cooperative, and very open to listening to the views and the suggestions of people who had done this successfully. Because I think that was the key. And because of that, it didn't take that long, actually. Mm -hmm. It could have taken very long, no, as you said, no, because of the challenges of, of making sure that we plan for the legacy um, uses of these facilities after the games. But because we really knew what we wanted, we knew that we had to benchmark from the best and most successful ones in the world, uh, it didn't take that long. But there, was a lot of, there were a lot of challenges, no, a lot of arguments between architects and engineers, a lot of arguments between the foreign consultants and the local um, architects and engineers. But, you know, thankfully, we were able to, you know, bridge those, um, those uh, divides and those arguments in the beginning to be able to finish planning within, I think, six months. Mm -hmm. Well, we, you mentioned a while ago that uh, the last time we actually constructed something of this scale, or at least the world class at that time was uh, in the 1930s with Rizal Memorial converting the uh, Manila Parade Grounds, the Carnival Grounds, to what it is today. Yes. And right now, even though those, those uh, venues still stand, we notice that there hasn't been a lot of room for those facilities to actually grow, expand yeah. with the times. Is the constructions that we have right now in Clark also geared to have that flexibility moving forward to actually be able to adapt to more uses, hopefully, as time goes by. Absolutely. Uh, like I said earlier, the planning of these facilities were put into the entire master plan for the, for the new metropolis we're trying to build, New Clark City. And because of that, um, we have already programmed for possible expansion. Like now, obviously now we have the athletic stadium, the uh, aquatic center, and then the village, the mm -hmm. athlete's village, the, dorm the dormitories. Um, but what we try to do, since we're planning them as mixed-use facilities, meaning uh, schools will be using them, yeah. um, obviously our Philippine Sports Commission and our Philippine Olympic Committee will be using them as a national training hub for our athletes. Um, but apart from that, we want to make, use, make them usable as also commercial facilities. That's why after the games, the plan is to privatize the operations and the maintenance of these facilities so that the private sector can work with us in order to find other uses, you know, commercial uses like for concerts for the stadium, yeah. for corporate events for both the stadium and the aquatic center and the other facilities. Um, we want to market them to... Um, to sports organizations abroad so that they can use them for sporting events in the region or globally, as well as training hubs for uh, teams all over the world. Well, it is going to be a long process before New Clark City is even being close to complete right Absolutely. now. I know that this is just the first phase. And uh, a lot of people right now are obviously wondering how to get there, the transport situation, yes. the infrastructure. And I'm sure there are lots of plans down the road right yes. now. But then for these games in particular, uh, just how accessible do you see uh, New Clark City for those fans in Manila, okay. for those who want to be able to come by from all around the Philippines? How could you explain the transport situation sure. that they're going to have to deal with? Okay, so now we've built a major highway 
connecting the Subic character Rock Expressway, that 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 uh, highway connected to NLEX and yeah. all the way to the, the north. Yeah. The SETEX. So now we've built a brand new road which connects SETEX to New Clark City. And from SETEX, in between the Clark exits and the Concepcion Tarlac exit, mm -hmm. uh, going to Baguio, there is a brand new exit there that will bring you to New Clark City from SETEX in 10 minutes or less. Okay. So oh, right from SETEX, you exit uh, the New Clark City exit, we, we call it, and then you're in the sports facilities within 10 minutes. Apart from that, um, obviously the Clark International Airport is only 15 to 20 minutes away from New Clark City via the SETEX. And later on, this is going to take maybe a couple of more years, maybe anywhere between three to five years, the train from Manila to Clark will reach New Clark City maybe by 2024 or 2020, 2023 to 2025. So those are all the uh, transport infrastructure that's going to be built. But for now, for the games in, uh, in, in a few weeks, mm -hmm. we're going to have point-to-point -point services from Clark from Manila and from other areas in Luzon to bring us to bring our spectators to New Clark City. Well, it sounds exciting, sir. And sir, we're not done with you yet. Later on, we're going to talk about more the venues itself, uh, the aquatic center and the athletic stadium. So for those watching at home, please don't go away. In focus, we'll be right back.